Okay, we have a packed agenda this afternoon, so we are going to get underway. So this morning, we began our discussion about the different dimensions of power in this new era of global power politics. And in a world, as we heard, and we all know, turned upside down by the invasion of Ukraine. We're going to continue that conversation now and turn our attention to the power of the green transition. So the power that the EU has to bring about positive change for people, for the planet and for prosperity, and the power that the green transition itself holds to bring about a more sustainable, a more resilient and a more competitive economy and society. I'm going to introduce our panelists uh, in a couple of minutes, but first, uh, Teresa Rivera Rodriguez, Deputy Prime Minister of Spain and Minister for the Ecological Transition and the Democratic Challenge, couldn't be with us, but she did want to address you. So before I bring our panel up, let's hear what she has to say. Not so far ago, back in 2019, the new commission kick off uh, their mandate, stating that we wanted to build an European approach built on a, a Green New Deal. This was a fantastic news coming from Brussels. Since then, there have been lots of things happening. In particular, there have been two shocks that uh, have impacted in our economies, in our prosperity, but also in the way we understand the energy transition and the importance to accelerate this transformation. First, we went through the, ter the terrible impact of the COVID crisis. And then we suffered the consequences of the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, by Putin, of course, impacting terribly on Ukrainian lives in the Ukrainian society, but also having an impact in the way we understand energy once it was clear that Putin was blackmailing the whole European Union. The social and economic consequence of these two dimensions made us even more committed to the EU energy transition. It is impossible to reduce our vulnerability, our fragility, if we do not change the understanding of energy production, the understanding of energy consumption. We have done lots of things since 2019. We have gone through this um, EU Green New Deal. We have gone this uh, Fit for 55 understanding of the climate and energy goals. We went through a climate law being passed by the parliament and we stated that the type of recovery we wanted to promote after the COVID crisis should be a green recovery, even more. Now, we think about the Red Power European Union, the understanding of uh, the reduction of vulnerabilities uh, towards uh, Russia, uh, taking into consideration that we need to build a much more committed, a much more united response around energy. This is very impressive. It has not been easy and we still need much to do. We count on some relevant clues when dealing with taxonomy and some commitments for a strategic autonomy that uh, reserves a great amount of resources, but also of energy policy around the transformation of the energy systems. Uh, this includes an understanding of how important it is to consider the complementarities of the different infrastructures and possibilities all along Europe, and how important it is to respond in a united manner, taking into consideration the flexibility and solidarity principles when facing the impact, the shock that we are going through. We have uh, been having lots of energy extraordinary councils in the last months, which is normal which has been a very important test of our commitment towards Europe and the principles that inspired the creation of the European Union. We have been forced to digest a big shock to reduce uh, more than 40% of our imports of gas coming from Russia and to substitute them by other alternatives, stressing the impact of uh, building solidarity and flexibility in the very short term, as I said, but uh, stressing the need to accelerate, to anticipate this energy transition that was ongoing and that needed to be accelerated, as I have just said. The only limit not to stop this transformation, not to make our lives more difficult, but to take into consideration something which is very important, the social impact of these changes. This is why the stress being put in the idea of uh, just transition is key. 
It was key before the invasion of Ukraine when thinking about uh, the ways to phase out coal without creating additional uh, difficulties to those people, to those uh, villages, those areas that uh, for generations had been very useful for the prosperity of the different countries around the coal economy. But this is not only the case that we need to put attention to. We also need to take into consideration the impacts of this uh, intense transformation in the consumers. So households, families, economies, but also the industrial demand, because we need to accelerate the transformation of our industry. We do not want to adjust our consumption of energy uh, through an increase of energy poverty or through the reduction of the demand from the industry. We need to be much more effective, much more efficient, much more committed to be smart when consuming and producing and producing energy, but uh, we also need to create other opportunities and to pay attention to the distributional impacts of what we are promoting. This is why the EU-wide response also in this crisis need to tackle the energy transition as the main driver for transformation, but being taken into consideration with the social measures, the social impact that uh, need to uh, be faced by the different national societies. In the time to come, there's still much to do. We have put in place many different measures that combine it, provide a good uh, ground so to uh, come up in this uh, difficult moment and to face and build into the future in the time to come, still to be uh, persevering in these uh, very same lines and to facilitate the industrial opportunities, the innovation, not to miss the train of the economy of the future, of the energy of the future, which is already a reality in our houses. So, Deputy Prime Minister of Spain there, Minister Teresa Rivera Rodriguez. Joining me now to discuss this in the room, I'm delighted to welcome Hans Brunings, Executive Director at the European Environment Agency. Please do come and uh, sit with me, Hans. Joining us online, uh, Connie Hedegaard, Chair of the Board of the KR Foundation and Chair of the Board of the Green Danish Green Think Tank, Conchito and Chair of the OECD's Roundtable for Sustainable Development, and also joining us, Annika Hedberg, Head of the Sustainable Prosperity for Europe Programme at the EPC. Uh, I'm hoping we still have Connie. I saw her before we showed the video. Hopefully she will magically reappear uh, in just a moment. But as uh, while we wait for that, Hans, let me turn to you. Um, and can you give us your assessment of the state of our green transition and the progress we're making. Do you believe, going back to this power theme running through all our discussions, that the EU is using its power effectively enough to deliver that change both at the scale required and at the speed required? Well, first of all, thanks for the invitation and congratulations on the anniversary. Here it's a pleasure always to work with the EPC. I think it's obvious that the European Green Deal is a game changer. It is the most powerful, most connected, most ambitious, most needle on the compass direction of travel setting political process that Europe has ever put on the tracks in this field. And if you go back to the previous commission, that commission hardly mentioned the environment at all in its uh, political ambitions. So it's a really sharp contrast. Secondly, I think it's clear that the targets are really high, uh, net uh, neutrality uh, in climate, uh, zero pollution. I mean, you can hardly be more ambitious than that. Uh, restoring nature where we have been uh, destroying nature for decades, but they are also needed. They're based on science, on knowledge. I mean, the science is clear. We are facing triple crises and so we have to be ambitious. Now, what I think is really good is that this political process has been translated in a policy process. The train of legislation under this Green Deal has been steady, has been at a speed and at a scale that we haven't seen before. And even in the context of COVID and of uh, the Ukrainian war, I think the Commission is sticking to that needle on the compass. The Commission's work program for next year is sending two really critical messages. 
first of all, business as usual is not going to solve these crises. Mm -hmm. And secondly, we should speed up and scale up drastic, radical transformations. Now, radical transformations is not language that you often read in those types of documents. So there is a clear signal there. At the same time, and being a realist, we are in a city with 25,000 lobbyists, where I would say 5,000 are pulling and cheering for the Green Deal, 5,000 are against it, and the others are trying to adjust it to their needs and their speed and their sector. And I think with the context that we're in now, we start to see pushback. And I think that is misguided. It is misguided because these crises are not going to away, are not going to go away. The longer we wait, the more costly they become to our society. And Europe is at the same time the continent that is investing more in innovation, in research, and in creating the conditions to be leading in this transition. And by slowing it down, we are making it more costly. We will incur the impacts of that, as we've seen last summer with heat waves and other things. And we, we might be losing some of the edge of leading in this transition. Okay. So is it going at the right speed and scale? I think we need to keep pushing for that. That is obvious. But the policy agenda and the needle on the compass, I think, are quite amazing given the context that we've had the last couple of years. So it really is a question of delivering what's on the table, implementation being key. Connie Hedegaard, thank you so much for joining us, albeit uh, virtually today. I know you had hoped to be with us in person, but it's wonderful to have you with us. Your assessment of where the EU is in this process and how effectively it's using its power to deliver this transition. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. And yes, I had very much hoped to be in the, in the hall today, today together with you. I can say to your question, I agree very much with what we just heard from, from Hans Brunix. Uh, it should be said, of course, that EU is more advanced than most and than anybody. And uh, I also think that EU deserves credit for having managed to strengthen the, the climate messaging and targeting even in the light of the Ukraine uh, war, I'll come back to that in just a minute. And it must also be said that without Europe, there would not have been a Paris Agreement, there would not have been an international framework that now starts to trickle down to nations, to cities, to big business, to investors. So that's all good and must be said. But no, when it comes to implementation, we are not at the speed uh, needed. Um, I think it's quite telling, isn't it? That when the war in Ukraine, uh, when Russia's uh, attack started on 24th of February, we were importing around 40% of our gas in Europe from Russia, exactly as we did back in 2012 during the economic crisis. We could have done so much more in the energy transition and energy efficiency and all this, I think that is just one illustration how we should speed up and accelerate uh, more. So what to do? Uh, Teresa was also mentioning fit for 55 and the reform of the ETS system, all very good. We are really good at target setting. Take the North Sea summit back in, in May, uh, four prime ministers, including a German chancellor, and uh, Ursula von der Leyen setting new targets for offshore wind, 150 gigawatt up before 2030, a six-fold effort compared to what we have today. It's fantastic. But I also have to say that if we are not speeding up our planning and permitting procedures, it will not materialize and it will create a credibility uh, gap. We must also remove bureaucratic and legislative bottlenecks. We must work in a different manner in our administrations, but also much more cooperation between public and private uh, sector. I think that maybe what is needed is a bit more of a corona mindset. You know, remember how we addressed the pandemic? I think we say for the next two years should go full in in an implementation mode and maybe in some resilient areas at sea, at land, allow for some more freedoms to do things uh, because of the urgency uh, of the situation. And then I think we should use our 
a European budget and the structural funds even more targeted, even more conditionalities could be put in there. And finally, I think that we should really move into a different gear when it comes to energy efficiency, material efficiency, circular economy. I mean, if we do not have a wake up call during this year, 2022, with value change, war, economic problems, and so on and so forth, then I really do not know when. And then just finally, this is all about also Europe, but you also mentioned Europe, Europe's power. I think that it is urgent that we reach out in a much more substantive manner to Africa. I think that it is urgent that we get our act together on our industry policies and competitive rules so that we are a bit more sharp also in light of the Inflation Act to define what is our strategic interest. And then we must speed up our innovation uh, mode. Just an example, the five missions that was adopted back in the summer of 2019 by all three EU institutions. Now we are talking about that the implementation platforms may be ready early 23. I think that everybody should realize that we are really good at target setting. We are on the right track, that's good, but we need to speed up and it starts with the work, work we, we work in our working mode, so to Thank speak. You. I think Thank we you. need reform there want to come back on many of those issues that you raise but Annika complete the picture for us in terms of your assessment of where we are and how effectively the EU is using its power to deliver. When we talk about EU's power and if we talk about the green power I think that we still wait this to be used for its full potential. If we understand power as the ability to bring about change, to alter thoughts, um, alter behaviors, get action in the direction where we want to go, the EU does have numerous tools at its disposal to bring about that positive change, to address the sustainability challenge at this planetary crisis that we are facing. And when we look at these tools, we have the regulatory power. The EU is a major rule maker and could be much greater rule enforcer as well. It is already playing an important role as a standard setter, could do even more in this front. As a second, the EU is an extremely important convening power. And it's not as a convening in a way that it brings together member states, uh, regions, stakeholders, for example, de develop and uh, push forward innovative research and development projects. But there is this enormous power in bringing organizations, member states together and really build on the power of collaboration in making the EU bigger than the sum of its parts. And I think that's extremely important. And as a third, obviously EU remains and is an extremely important economic power. And in this front, it is, we see it's a significant provider of public funding. It can be a mobilization, a mobilize, mobilize private investment. And we shouldn't forget, it's a major producer and consumer, not least with its over 4 million, 400 million consumers that we have on our market. And just picking up on that, on the consumption, because this is often ignored and I find that we've not taken enough measures to really look at demand side. And we should remember that every product that we consume here in Europe comes with an environmental climate footprint. And often these impacts are felt beyond our borders. And if we just take a look at the example of fuel, food, animal feed, these imports are having climate environmental impacts and as a result also are impacting global food security. At the same time, becoming smarter with the resources that we have here in Europe can bring multiple benefits for our economy, for our society, for resilience, for security. And I'll give you two no-brainers. One, energy efficiency. This is an old figure. Every 1% gained in energy efficiency can save us 2.6% in gas imports. And the second one, circular economy. 
we know and we talk about the potential about the accelerating the transition to circular economy and we should be doing so much more to actually gay enjoy the benefits that this could bring for the economy for society giving us the access to the critical materials we so desperately need, uh, creating the jobs and the business opportunities that it can bring, helping us to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we desperately need to do. So just to say, there is so much more that we can be done, do, uh, we could be doing. And I would just um, maybe make two points. Very One, good, on positive sides, we see the EU does recognize that it has these powers and it is actually doing a lot to use these powers to bring about a positive change. The regulatory power, the convening power, as well as the economic power. But on the negative side, and that has been also reflected in what we've heard already now, the challenge is that we have these fantastic tools in our hands, but unfortunately their use is often hampered by vested interests, national interests, which undermine the European interest, the global interest, okay. as well as just the failure to implement the agreed goals and um, targets. And so we keep coming back on that issue of implementation, implementation, implementation. But I just want to pick up, uh, hands on something uh, you said at the beginning, and you, you also, Connie, touched on Ukraine and the impact, and you made a link, Annika, because you said it's a no-brainer, energy efficiency, and you directly linked it to gas imports. But Hans, you said we are starting to see a pushback, and it's misguided. How do we rebut that pushback, if you like? How do we push back on the pushback? Um, and are you concerned that measures that might be taken now or, or in the future to deal with the energy crisis, the cost of living crisis, far from taking us further towards our green transition, could take us away? How do you see sticking? You, I think it was a phrase, commission, I think it was Connie said, the commission is sticking to the needle and the compass it may have been you but how do we make sure it stays on that course as things get tougher and tougher well first of all i think the commission uh, in its proposals and in the legislative train is sticking to the needle on the compass and that is good um one advantage in our discussions about the energy transition from this horrible war is that uh, for the last five years there has been a lot of discussion about gas as an essential part of the transition to uh, mm. to an, a renewable energy system um, it's clear that that is a serious discussion now how how sustainable was that idea how much are we relying on imported gas from not only ukraine but other regions that may have uh, political dimensions that are not always in line with how we look at our societies and political systems. So I think that that discussion is there. And it's clear that in the ambitions now on the energy union and also on how we work with uh, areas around Europe, uh, the neighborhood south, the neighborhood east, that we are now pushing for a, a faster breakthrough of uh, renewables. And, and that indeed should be the line of thinking where I'm more concerned is that uh, there was a, a whole set of other ambitions that are linked to uh, chemicals safe and sustainable by design. That's a, a major policy package that uh, we need to address. We look at the circular economy package that came out yesterday, and I agree completely with uh, Annika that that there there is a we need to really speed that up because we know from data that it's going really slow. It's going too slow, and our resource use is critical there. So if this sort of resource reflection coming from the war uh, in Ukraine is prompting us to think more about circularity and, and about also the demand side issues, that would be beneficial. And if we think of, of the, 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 the horrific impact on resources that will be needed to rebuild Ukraine, I mean, it it's uh, it, it will it will have an impact also in Europe, and there will be a demand on Europe. So, if anything, staying the course and recognizing that some of the price signals that are now coming in the markets from this crisis are not the normal trend lines; they are exceptional. Huh? So, you, I, I now get sometimes questions: 
you have been pleading for price signals on energy for some time. You see where we are now with your price signals. Well, these are not normal price no, exactly. signals. These are crisis signals. Okay. So staying the course is really important. Thank you. And Connie, you, you praised the EU. You said for strengthening the climate messaging, even in the face of the invasion of Ukraine. But are you concerned about a pushback, uh, particularly as the economic weather gets stormier and stormier? How do we make sure uh, that this, that the, the invasion of Ukraine continues to act as a catalyst for the transition and not does not become an inhibitor? Yes, of course, I'm concerned, not because anybody would sort of neglect climate out of bad will, but I think that there is so much on decision makers plate these days. So, so that is maybe the, the biggest fear. And then I also have the fear that we, in order to come through in a good manner, uh, not only this winter, but also next winter, uh, for good reasons, uh, governments and EU is out finding new sources of uh, energy and also for uh, gas and LNG and what have we. But the big risk is that we make some choices where we are locking ourselves in to even more dependency on, on fossil fuels. So I think that that is the risk. But as I said, I think that so far, and uh, they have really tried those in power to, to, to really stay the course. I only wonder how come that we are not in the public domain speaking a bit more about energy efficiency, material efficiency, uh, recycling, things like that. If there ever was a time where that message could go well down with the citizens, I think that that would be exactly in light of, of the current crisis. And that would also have a some social component to it. Whereas what we are doing now, we are spending so far 700 billion euros compensating uh, those most vulnerable. Uh, mm. Everyone can see why that is happening, but I think it should tell us that we need to go at one step deeper and maybe also change our taxation system and the way we really price things also for, for the longer term in Europe. Thank you. And Annika, just in terms of this, to what extent do you think the crisis response so far has broadly stayed in line with our, I, mean, I think it was, um, uh, Connie said yeah, earlier, we're great at setting the targets. Are we staying in line when, when we come to the crisis response? And how do we make sure that we remain in line as it gets more difficult? I think we need to be honest that the jury's out. Every day we're making decisions at the moment that will have impacts, for example, for our energy system, our food system, and as such will have both short and long-term impacts. And these decisions, the policies, the investments that are being made today will determine whether we'll be able to actually carry out the green transition, whether we will be able to create that economy of the future that we so desperately want, which will be sustainable, which will be resilient, will provide us that sustainable prosperity that we need. So the jury is out. I do think that we have seen some positive signals. Obviously, still the rhetoric is out there, which is extremely important. Our policymakers are communicating that we are committed still to the clean energy transition and that we are committed to the Green Deal. The challenge is indeed always, as has been already said, actually turning those words into action. And those, whether those words are turned into action will be judged by the investments we're making. And on one hand, we are, for example, looking at the clean energy transition. So we have seen push for greater energy efficiency. Obviously, there are a lot of efforts being made at the moment to save energy, uh, which is also forced on us because of the circumstances. We are seeing investments in renewable energies. But then at the same time, and on a downside, we are also seeing extremely worrying signals when it comes to, for example, subsidies for fossil fuels, the, the push yeah. for new fossil fuel infrastructure. We have new focus and a greater talk, more talk about um, biofuels, which can have huge impacts for global food security. So now the question is what actually will happen um, in reality? So very much echoing that warning from Connie about locking in our dependency hands. You wanted to come back in. Yeah, I want to uh, build on something that was said uh, by the two previous interventions. Indeed, uh, we focus a lot on what we should be uh, scaling up and speeding up. And, and we invest in it, we, we do research and development, we 
promote that renewable energy, different type of agriculture, you know, all of these things where we pay, don't pay a lot of attention is what we should stop doing, what we should be phasing out. We are not focusing our, our systems, our governance on that. And the environmentally harmful subsidies have been mentioned. We've been talking about this for 25 years the EU and the OECD, we are still globally subsidizing fossil fuels more than the climate fund that we should be filling uh, to, to keep the train moving in global climate uh, negotiations. We are still seeing tax systems where we've been giving signals to member states, you have to green your tax system. We did a report on it last year. I can summarize it in four words. It's going nowhere. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, that is really concerning fossil fuels. We are still negotiating with European power in UNFCCC in a final text. You cannot mention fossil fuels, but you can mention IPCC. Those mentioning IPCC should know what they say. We need to phase out fossil fuels. It's crystal clear. The same is true with inequality, spatial planning. I mean, we know what we should be phasing out, but that's of course where the conflicts are and where part of the lobbying is and where the vested interest and the lock-ins okay. are. So more attention for phasing out. That would be my central message. Connie, also. please do react to that. But can I also bring us, because we have very limited time in this discussion, to the outcome of COP27 uh, and where we saw on the one hand, something quite historic in terms of the agreement on the loss and damage fund for those countries hit hardest, that acceptance by the developed world that they are responsible for the damage caused. But on the other side, no further action on reducing emissions. What is your assessment of that and the role the EU played and, and how effective it was being as a climate power in those discussions? But please do also react to what Hans said. Yeah, then first to, to Hans, uh, I, of course, agree uh, on the subsidies. And, and you know what? I think that communication here from those who know, those who in power, to the broad, broader citizens, I think it's extremely important. And I think there has been a tendency to pretend as if we can make this big transition, transformation in the time scale we have as if nobody would really feel any difficulties with that. I think a bit more honest information would be really, really good. I know that many are afraid, many in power would be afraid of saying, yes, there are hard choices and hard priorities ahead of us because they fear yellow vests. But you know what? I fear even more the polarization that we would see in our own societies if we are not reaching the targets that not least to a young generation uh, is, are, are so crucial. You, you really risk having a different kind of polarization and a democratic legitimacy issue, which will be as important. On, on the COP27, I think it was, yes, it was good on the loss and damage. Some of us have unfortunately a memory that goes way back. So in 2012, loss and damage was agreed in Qatar that we should do something on loss and damage at next year we should have the solutions ready. Now we stand here 10 years after and everybody is happy that it has been decided now to do something about it. But next year they will have to define uh, who is going to pay what in the midst of a, an American election campaign, just to mention one of the obstacles. So it is challenging, but I also think that we should not have too much emphasis on what the annual COPs can do the good thing from Sharm el Sheikh was that a lot of CEOs of business of civil society was there focusing on implementation, on solutions. And, and that is probably the, the positive thing you can say that so many more are now really zooming in on what really makes it in the end, the real solutions. On Thank the you. And a, and a quick one, and then I'll come out to all of you. Janneke, just picking up on that point about, on the one hand, that concern that we will see mass social protest, the yellow vest, the cost of it, but Connie pointing out for younger generations, and we are seeing it, uh, the beginning of more and more protests because you're not doing enough and you're not doing it fast enough. Do you think the whole debate about the just transition in the light of Ukraine, in the light of the energy crisis and the cost of living crisis, do we need to revisit that discussion as well to convince people that this is very much central? We accept 
there are people who will be hit hard. We don't pretend it's a win-win for everyone. How do you see that briefly, if you would? Absolutely. The just transition will be a key. It was, as uh, we heard already before, it was important before, and it's even more important now. The number of vulnerable people is growing by the day, and we obviously need to try to support them, not only in this transition, but it is in this crisis mode when we have a lot of people across Europe are being hit hard with the cost of living crisis, with the energy prices going up, with the food prices going up. Mm -hmm. And so obviously we need to find the tools to help them. I think that what is extremely important when we're talking about the just transition is to realize that on one hand, there's this aspect of communication. Communi leaders communicating to people that we are with you, we will support you, we will find the way to get across this crisis together. On, and then actually manage those costs, the transitional costs, the impacts on people, and they get, you must actually commit and deliver on that. But there's a third dimension to the just transition. And I think it's also extremely important and that's especially important for the young people. The people need to feel empowered. They need to be given the tools, the ways to actually contribute to the transition. And that's especially important for the Thank young you. people. They need to have the hope. Thank you very much. Any questions uh, from the room? I see Joe Linen uh, is Ready. No, no, I'm perfectly happy. I like, I like to move. It keeps me fit. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jackie. Yeah, um, well done, uh, all the presentations. Uh, my question, the green uh, transformation yep. goes along with the race of the technologies we need for that uh, transformation. And I see what the Chinese have done and will do and what the Biden administration is doing. Uh, are we not, again, like in the digital area, uh, are lagging behind. Which is a point that we came and, up with. Uh, now. Connie was uh, arguing that we have to reach out more to other parts of the world. Indeed, yesterday somebody said the global gateway is a laughter. And um, do we not need new instruments to go out with uh, what we can and what we have uh, to other parts of the world. Thank you. And that issue of the race for technologies came up in our first panel and will come up in our next one as well. Paul. Yes, a uh, question maybe in particular to my compatriot, Connie Hildegard. Uh, you mentioned the uh, uh, Investment Reduction Act in the United States. Um, we uh, hear not very positive voices around the world about the CBAM. There seems to be a clash coming up between trade policy and climate policy. What can we do, and I'm talking to you, as the chair of an OECD committee to hinder that this happens. There was uh, during you. the G6 meeting this summer, the idea of a carbon club. Is that a reality? Can something be done? Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. I'm going to squeeze one more in and I'm going to run to the back here because I don't want to always be accused of favoring those who are at the front. Can we do a little bit of quick cooperation down the line? Thank you very much. So, sorry for keeping you running. Um, yeah, thank you, Tillman Kupfer. Um, just the two points on, on the lock-in question, because um, <clears throat> you mentioned that, um, that there's a lot of investment going in gas and LNG. How can we make sure that uh, this LNG investment actually can be used also for hydrogen? Because that's, that's what many claim that could be done. Is this realistic? And the other one you mentioned also Africa, Connie. Um, uh, that, is, uh, that Europe needs to look more after Africa again. How do we make sure that the investment goes in renewables, in solar, and not again in exploration of new oil fields? Thank yes. you very much. Connie, let's come back to you, uh, because a couple of those very specifically to you, and particularly this potential clash, as Paul sees it, between trade and climate policy. Yeah, and, and I agree that a very, very big conflict potentially could be looming there. I, I would have hoped that there could be sort of a, a, a decent dialogue with the uh, Americans on the CBAM and finding ways so that we are sure that it's not clashing with the WTO and things like that. We've done a number of roundtables on that uh, in, in the OECD. I think that should be possible, but I think that the Inflation uh, Act, it, it, it now there is a risk that we end up in, in more protectionism. And that was why I initially said here in my first inter intervention that I really think that we must be a bit sharper on defining where do we have real strategic interest 
and and then there modify our our, our positions and and it's not enough just to say free trade free trade free trade when the world around you uh, are doing differently uh, we, we must defend our values uh, of course but but i really think where we have strategic interest we need a rethink uh, but i think that still uh, the jury is out for the cbam whether we will i mean we will not get through with it unless we find a, a way forward with the Americans would be uh, would be my bid. And then just uh, to your line in on, on the race of technologies, uh, I mentioned the, 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 the missions. That was also sort of a way of saying, can we sometimes pool our forces a bit more in Europe so that we are faster in accelerating innovation? I know, for instance, the CEO Alliance, 12, 14 of the CEOs for the leading companies for different sectors in Europe, they, have, they are now working together across silos, across sector lines to see, can they cooperate in order to accelerate new technologies? And I think that we need much more of that, but that again also means that we should not be so afraid of subsidizing very infant technologies at the early stage if we want to win these races. Thank you very much. I just want to, please do pick up hands if you want to any of those points, but I wanted, we have very little time left, to come back on your point about implementation, because you welcome that the politics has become a policy process, uh, and you said it's ne on a scale never seen before, but it's still not enough. What for you is the central challenge if we are to speed up the implementation process? It is to embed sustainability fully in the European social and economic model. Because that is where I really think the societal pushback can be. And that's where I now speak as somebody who is a true believer in the European model, an economic model and a social model embedded in a democratic system. And I think that is the challenge for Europe to illustrate that we can reach these very high and necessary targets on sustainability in a society that doesn't let people fall through the cracks that's our socio-economic model and in a society that is strongly democratic and based on rule of law because i refuse as a european to accept that the solution is in any form of enlightened uh, authoritarianism or in any other form we need to stick to these values. And I think the next commission, I don't have a crystal ball, will by definition have to work on implementing the European Green Deal because it's embedded in legislation now. Yep. I think the real, the real issue will be what type of social and economic model and tools will we use to make sure that this becomes a winning proposition for European society and European economy. That for me is the real challenge. Thank you very much. And for you, Annika, uh, as we look ahead and we look at the EU using that power that we've talked about and you enumerated some of the levers it has, what for you is going to be the key priority if the European Union is to exercise that power as effectively as possible to really bring about this change at the speed and scale you've all underlined is so essential? When we're talking about a key priority, um, I actually would want to focus on leadership. I think what we desperately need is that our leaders, and I'm not just talking about our politicians and policymakers, but we have leaders across society, opinion influencers, media, business leaders, they can all play a role in convincing, communicating and providing the solutions, the means for us to address the sustainability challenge. and gets us on the right track. And I think that this really must be a key priority is that we see across our society this recognition that we need to see this as a common challenge, which requires joint approaches, and that uh, we have people who are in those positions of power to actually take this on board and really make this the ultimate goal in their own world, and, lives as well. And Connie, of all the issues we've discussed uh, in this session, if you had to identify one key next step, one central priority uh, to deliver, use that power as effectively as possible, both in terms of meeting the EU's targets, but also in providing that global leadership, what would it be? Well, I think there are some lessons learned, Jackie, from the pandemic that we could uh, really use now. We, we have to, to work in new modes, in new manners, across sectors, 
also across public and private. I think we have a huge resource there. And then I think there's one good thing that we haven't mentioned because of the war in Ukraine, uh, Poland and others who were normally holding back the ambition level and things like that in, in the climate field, they are very much now into sort of the energy transition. So there is a, a chance of being more aligned there in Europe than before. And finally, I would just say more honest communication to the citizens on what it takes for us really to deliver on all the nice ambitions and targets. I think mm. that is absolutely key for obvious democratic reasons. Thank you. And Hans, just very briefly before we go, uh, Connie suggesting that we have a real moment of opportunity because that change in perceptions in Eastern Europe, what for you is the key to seizing that moment and making the most of it? The most ambitious possible implementation of two key elements of the European Green Deal, and that is the just transition, because that will give it the legitimacy in our societies. And the second element is the financial part, because it's the financial system yeah. that will be driving uh, change in many ways. So if those two key parts of the European Green Deal can be implemented in the most ambitious way, I think we are uh, really driving the agenda forward. And on that note, will you join me in thanking Connie, Hans and Annika very much indeed for a fantastic discussion. Thank you so much for joining us, Connie. Thank you, Hans. Really great to have you with us again. Uh, and again, once again, I just wish we had twice as long. But um, thank you so much.